And I am going to be quite vulnerable in, in my answer to this. First of all, I felt a lot of guilt. I felt like I was giving in, you know, selling out on my baby because because Affectiva is like my baby. And 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 what I've come to realize that it's it's not selling out. It is graduating to a new chapter. Right. So so my daughter, you know, just turned 18 and she just started college. And so we moved her into her. I, I haven't given up on her. It's just a new form of our relationship. Hey, it's Sarah. I've been waiting to share some exciting news and the wait is finally over. As of this month, Billion Dollar Moves is part of the creators program at the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. That means we have access to tons of new resources like editors and marketers that help us create high quality episodes and grow a community. We're also in great company with podcasts like one of my favorites, Finding Founders, where host Samuel Donner interviews the world's most prolific thinkers and founders who reveal how their darkest moments inspired their success. Check out Finding Founders and learn more about HubSpot creators at hubspot.com slash creators. Welcome to Billion Dollar Moves, the show for the top US and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, to scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all in the world of venture and business. I'm your host, Sarah Chen Spellings. Tremendous year for you, Rana. Congratulations. A lot of excitement and we want to dig into that. H how are you feeling? I have you fully sort of uh, come to the moment that, yes, I've exited. This is the next stage. I am working on it. It's definitely been uh, a process. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've uh, been doing what I'm doing for the last 20 years and I been co-founded the company uh, almost 12 years ago. So a yeah. big part of my identity is related to the company. And so I'm figuring out like, what does it all mean? And trying to take a step back and kind of um, look at all the opportunities in front of me. It's yeah, good. It's all that. good. It's all good. Good. But we're going to come back to that. But let's really, you know, take us back to uh, the beginning of time here with really your journey. <laughs> Muslim Egyptian woman. And I know you've written this about, you know, your journey in, in your memoir. I see the book right there, Gold Decoded, that we want to talk about as well. But just bring us back uh, a little bit into years ago, you know, when you were uh, in Egypt, came across this book and decided that, hey, uh, I'm going to go to Cambridge, England and do something. Talk to us about this. You know, how did this all come to be? Why did this matter so much to you that you needed to do it? So I was born in Cairo, Egypt. We're Egyptian. Um, and my family um, worked around the Middle East. So I grew up partially in Kuwait and then in Abu Dhabi. Both my parents are technologists. So from a very young age, I was exposed to the latest and greatest technology. And what struck me the most is how technology changes the way we connect and communicate with one another. And that's really been a common theme of my career. So I studied computer science as an undergraduate and really wanted to become faculty at the American University in Cairo. And so um, I thought, OK, well, I need to go abroad, get a PhD and come back to Egypt and teach. And uh, that was my first foray into research. And, and as you said, I read a book very serendipitously towards, um, you know, the end of my undergraduate years called the called Affective Computing. It was written by this MIT professor, Rosalind Picard. And she posited that computers need to understand emotions just as humans do. And that literally, I was so inspired by the idea. It, mm. uh, it changed the trajectory of, of my life and my research. So what was it about that book, really, that got you thinking about um, the way the world works? You know, was it the thesis of it? Was it... Um, her as a scientist herself and, and doing the work that she's doing, how, how did this influence you? You know, the, the, it was very interesting because 
I was thinking about how to build um, artificial intelligence. And if you look at how humans, if you look at human intelligence, your IQ matters, but your EQ, your ability to have emotional intelligence and sense and understand other people's emotions, that's really key. So once you dive into the psychology literature, you realize that people who have higher EQs are just better humans. They're more likable, they're more persuasive, they're more successful in their personal professional lives. And that was completely missing from the narrative around AI or technology in general. So I was really intrigued by that. As you can tell, I'm a very animated human, right? Like I really, <laughs> I really kind of tap into like people's like nonverbal signals, like sure, what, whatever you're saying is whatever you're saying, but how are you saying it and what kind of facial expressions are going with it? So that kind of majority of our communication, which is nonverbal, has always intrigued me. And I wanted to figure out if there was a way to build computers that can detect those signals. And how did you take this? I mean, you know, I think a lot of it, it's safe to say a lot of professors, a lot of academics get wrapped up in a certain niche, right? You know, pursuing a right. certain topic, a certain thesis. But you then decide to build this into a company, and actually get it to a commercial state and actually, you know, now have uh, exited it into the next level of, of uh, uh, with, with smart eye. So, so talk to us a little bit about, you know, that transition from, um, I guess, that vision, right? You wanted to be uh, mm -hmm. an educator, really, right. to then acting on it and building a sustainable business from it. So, so, you know, I always talk about outgrowing your dreams because to me, it was very interesting. My dream was to go back home and become faculty. But once I got to Cambridge and then built this emotionally intelligent machine and actually towards the end of my PhD, again, very serendipitously met Ross Picard in person. She was visiting Cambridge, giving a talk and wanted to meet with some PhD students. And she and I met up and just totally hit it off. And she said, why don't you come work with me as a postdoc? And of course I was like, oh, this is like a dream come true. So, so I joined her lab as a postdoc, still thinking it's academia, but very quickly at MIT, it became apparent that there was so much commercial interest in the technology. And we had like at least 20 Fortune 500 companies wanting to buy our, you know, our solution. And this was research code. So we didn't really have a mechanism to give it to the Pepsis of the world or the Bank of America's. Um, and so in 2009, she and I decided to co-found Affectiva. She stayed a, as an MIT professor and, and I basically kind of switched career from academia to industry and, and grew the company and, you know, finance, you know, brought in venture yeah. capitalists. And um, so it's, it's been, it's been an incredible, for, for me, actually, what was the tipping point of going from academia to industry was realizing I have a very perhaps unique opportunity to bring technology to the world at scale because academia is usually not at scale. And, and I felt like that could be, you know, quite transformative. Yeah. And it's, it's that thought. I, I think what you're speaking to, I've, I've heard many said before is that the biggest fear, if, if that could be the right word, is that the missed opportunity of not bringing right. this to the world, right. And the vision for what you can see. Um, and, and I'm glad that you have brought that to us. So tell us a little bit. I mean, you know, we have um, a little bit of a snippet of, of what this technology does in, in interpreting technology, uh, sort of different emotions. And I know you've built the largest emotion depository mm -hmm. um, that are that's now being used in a certain way. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how that technology works and how has that evolved from, I guess, paper theory when you were uh -huh. researching it into right. Uh, the commercial light. So the core, I guess, technology, the, the premise is only 10% of how we communicate is in the actual choice of words we use. 90% is nonverbal, and it's split almost equally between your facial expressions, your hand gestures, and your vocal intonation. My background, my, so my PhD work was all about the face. So I mm -hmm. kind of um, built technology that can understand your facial, can recognize your facial expression. So it can detect if you're smiling or frowning or looking surprised. Um, and the way you do that is you, you use machine learning techniques like deep learning and neural networks. I'm sure a lot of our listeners and, and viewers have, have heard of these terms. But the key thing is we need gobs and gobs of data. We need hundreds of thousands of examples of diverse people smiling and frowning and you know, looking excited. 
And, and so the data became really key. And over the last you know, 10 or so years, we have amassed the largest um, kind of natural emotion data repository. We have over 11 um, you know, facial responses, which is about 5 billion facial frames from 90 countries around the world. It's just fascinating to see how different cultures express emotion around the world. Um, I, I, I continue to find that just really fascinating. Yeah, so you used um, sort of these different facial expressions as a basis um, for different uses. Talk to us a little bit of some of the use cases here. And, and I know you came uh, to a very important point where your values were tested, right? In terms of right. uh, being approached, you were given a $40 million check to potentially use it in surveillance, but chose not to. So what, what, what were the use cases for this and what did you eventually choose was the right uh, use of your mind share to, to use your words? I mean, the cool thing about this technology is that there are so many applications of it. I mean, you know, we always joke as a team that any party we go to where people are like, oh, so what do you do? And we start explaining and, and inevitably, you know, the person will, will say, oh, have you considered like gaming? Have you considered building a dating app? Like yeah. there's always so many applications. So the challenge for Affectiva and now SmartEye is to decide on which applications to focus on. So um, our very first use case at MIT actually was in autism. So we built this device. It was a Google Glass-like device with you know, a, a Bluetooth headset. And it gave the kid um, real-time feedback on his or her interactions. So it would say, you know, you know, this person looks interested. This person looks disinterested. And it was like a training and a, and a help help self-help tool um but at affectiva um we realized that there were so many applications everything from advertising research where we help gosh 28 percent of the fortune global 500 companies get a sense of the emotional engagement their mm -hmm. viewers have with their products and contents and services um to automotive i'm sure we'll get to that because that was the premise of the acquisition eventually um but but we but 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 we routinely get approached to apply the technology in areas like security and surveillance and lie detection, and we just feel very strong. We actually have core values that we decided on when we first started the company, and you know they include things like everything has to be opt-in based, consent based, yeah. very clearly. You have to get value in return uh, for this very personal data you're sharing. And we just recognize that there's power asymmetry here, right? Like governments and, and, and big, com big tech companies own all of this data, but me as a consumer, I don't have any say about how you use it or who gets access to it. And so we didn't want to play, um, play in that space. And in, you know, in 2011, we were raising money for the company. We were almost actually out of money. We had two months runway and this uh, venture arm of an intelligence agency, um, they reached out and they said, we will potentially give you up to $40 million, but you had got to pivot the company and focus on security and surveillance. And we just, it did not match our core values. And so we turned it down, not knowing if we're going to be able to raise money elsewhere. I mean, we were taking the risk of just running out of money and shutting down, but we felt it was the right thing to do. And, you know, we were able to raise money from other investors that share our core values and our vision. And to me, that's, you know, that's a real big lesson. If, if I were to do this all over again, I would still make the same decision and stick mm. to our core values, even if it meant less revenue for the company. Yeah, and Rana, that's such an interesting point to it. I want to dive deeper on, you know, you said you started uh, with a set of cult, uh, sort of core values that you wanted to hold yourself to, you and your co-founder. As the years go on, you know, with the entrepreneurship journey, there are multiple pivots, you have to adapt, things like that. How do you know that what you've decided in the past rings true today? And, and what I'm bringing up here is, you know, Adam Grant, a fellow YGL, who brings up the, the concept of rethink and rethink again, totally. right? And And for you, I mean, Sure, there are certain elements of, of uh, where we don't like the, the power symmetry, giving that to government, but it also serves a certain good, right? How do you think about that, especially as things evolve over time? 
This is a great question because you're absolutely right. I, we have over the course of Affectiva's journey, the last 12 years, we, we would routinely actually have a debate, a company-wide debate. It was an open, you know, open forum where we would have the debate on whether we should reconsider this. Should we, you know, help governments, especially, you know, every time we would see examples of public safety kind of floating becoming front and front and center of mind, we would we would pose the question, you know, should we reevaluate our decision? But every time we fell back to the same place, the technology is not ready. Regulation's not there. It's not regulated at all. And there is just a lot of potential for abuse and discrimination and profiling. It was just so it always felt not the right thing to do. But but I agree with you. It's important to pose and repose the question um, because because the world evolves and technology evolves and what society thinks of technology evolves. So, um, yeah, it's important to keep reevaluating. Yeah. Well, good to, good to hear that. I mean, you know, I think, uh, sometimes there's a lot of, uh, fear, right? Even this, let, let's talk about the landscape here. I think there's a lot of fear of AI, right? That's in, in movies, the first thought comes to mind is the robot learns, you know, whatever, and then attacks the human race, right? So there's a lot of, of fear. And I, I love one of the quotes in your book, which you say that the real problem is not the existential threat of AI, okay. but really the ethical um, use of AI here. And, and I want to get your view on this. You know, when, when ethics is such an intangible concept and you talked about diversity, you talk about things that, you know, I care deeply about as well, you know, in understanding different cultures, different standards, how does affective, uh, you know, in you being the leader at the helm, think about ethical lines here, you know, who decides and how, how do you think about this? So the way I like to think about it is I, I, I divide it into like two buckets, the ethical development of AI and then the ethical um, deployment of AI. So on the development side, it's really all about mitigating data and algorithmic bias. So and I'll give you an example. If we trained, you know, a lot of the training data that's out there is basically middle aged white men. So if you train these algorithms to detect various expressions of this non-diverse group of people, and then you deploy the algorithms on people like me or you, it's just not going to work because the algorithm has never seen people that look like us. Um, mm. So it, it'll, it'll, it'll fail. And so I've been a huge advocate for really implementing processes within the company to make sure that the data is diverse and that, that we're very thoughtful and intentional in how we train and validate these algorithms. And, um, you know, that cuts across data collection, data annotation, data validation, like it's every single step of the way. And, and I guess that the theory of, of how you want to run your business is, is embedded in every single thing from the process, sourcing the data, so on and so forth. But how do you even guide your team, you know, in, in something like this? And, you know, what comes to mind really is what you talked about in which big tech is known mm -hmm right, to be um, successful because they've been uh, taking risks, they've been scaling quick, you know, um, move move right. and break things and, and things like that. And, and how do you speak to your team about ethics when all around them, you know, the environment is completely in a, in a different world almost? Yeah, I feel strongly that ethics is a business issue. It's not just marketing fluff. It's not just, you know, something you, you talk about on the side. It has to be deeply ingrained in every business decision. It has to be deeply ingrained in every business decision you make. Uh, and, and that includes, you know, what industries you play in, but it also in, includes how. And, and again, I, I think you have to be very intentional about it. So, so for a number of years before the acquisition, we had our executive team, um, bonus plan, not just tied to growing the company, but actually to, to ensuring that we have operationalized how we mitigate bias in our technology. Um, so that was really interesting, right? Like, so now all of the executive yeah. team were incentivized to pay attention to how we're doing around this whole ethics issue because part of their comp is tied to it. So I, I, from what I know, this is quite unusual, but, but I think we need to see more forms of that. I mean, similarly, when we were raising money from investors, most investors didn't ask us about our ethics plan 
And I was adamant to bring on investors that were savvy that way. And so we ended up mm. in our last round again before the exit with investors who were asking, oh, like, you know, how are you thinking about ethics? Like, what is your, you know, ethics code of conduct? And I love that. We need more investors who care about this stuff because then that forces startups and, and other companies to, to be serious about it. Just a quick note before we get back to the show. While you're listening to this podcast, you're probably doing something else too. Mastering the art of cooking, driving your kids to practice, dancing like no one's watching. We get it. When you're having conversations with your customers, the same is probably true for them. They're IMing their teams, mentally planning date nights. So growing conversations beyond the moment can be challenging. HubSpot helps you go beyond the moment by connecting you and your teams giving you access to the exact same data and helping you see the full customer picture. What motivates them, what their expectations are, and how you can blow them out of the water. With powerful tools that connect marketing, sales, ops, and service, HubSpot's powerful CRM platform powers you and your teams to transform customer moments into extraordinary customer experiences. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. Now back to the show. Yeah, and, and I love sort of the, the two-way dynamic here as well and you um, choosing your investors, right? And a mm-hmm. lot of times startups are in this position where they feel like, oh, you know, I'm running out of money. I just I just need a check, like whatever. But then you right. don't realize uh, it is really a marriage and, and you have the power to actually choose and, and pick your investors. And that actually has a, a larger impact on the whole industry. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. And now I want to turn to, you know, fundraising, as, as you talked about, it, it was two women, you were then wearing a hijab <laughs> yes. when you were just getting started, talking mm-hmm. about emotion. How did fundraising go for you in the <laughs> beginning? And, uh, you know, what, what were you, some of your biggest lessons there? It was definitely challenging, because to your point, we were um, primarily pitching to um, you know, o- older men um, in, in, in the Bay Area, but also around the world. And yeah, two women, I was wearing the hijab, we're pitching an emotion company. It was tough. I, I will say we always got a lot of respect because we, we were the world experts when it came to this technology. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but we were so outside of what they were typically used to seeing in founders that it was just very risky for these investors to invest in. And, and, and actually, that's why I've now become a huge advocate for not just supporting female founders, but we need female funders. We need more investors who are different because they're going to invest in different ideas and different um, entrepreneurs. And that's super key. And, and I've actually, I'm part of an organization called All Ways. So I want to um, give yeah. a shout out to them because they support both sides of the equations. We support female founders and we do a lot of activity, um, you know, to make sure that they are getting in front of the right investors. But we also support women on their path to become investors, everything from angel investing to, you know, starting and growing um, their their own funds. Um, so that's really key. So it was not easy. Um, once we got the first check, it was definitely, you know, we were well on our way, but even in the last, you know, in 2018, we raised a $26 million round from the automotive industry, very male dominated still. So right. it hasn't really changed. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of work to do. Mm. So from the point of which you raised your first check um, and had, I, I suppose your first check, you had your MVP already, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then years later to that $26 million round, how did you feel uh, the conversation shift that when you say, you know, you still see how male dominated it is, but how did the conversation shift and, you know, what were some of your, I guess, lessons in, in fundraising there? I mean, one of the things that I really noticed um, is women tend to just be, um, what's the word, hedge a lot more. Like I remember even when I was pitching our deck and sometimes um, my chief strategy officer uh, super awesome um, guy w- w- would would join me. I would always, you know, when I'm talking about our numbers, I would also I would always say things like, "I think this is going to become a billion dollar industry or a multi billion dollar industry," because mm. because 
the truth is I don't really know, right? Like we have assumptions in place and we have predictions in place, but, but I always hedged and, um, my male colleague, he was just like, this is going to become a multi-billion dollar industry by, you know, 2023. And I was like, whoa. And I, I see that a lot. I hear that a lot. And um, mm. I've now started to do some angel investing and, and I see that as a pattern. Um, I don't know if there's a right or wrong, but I, I think, um, you know, once you're, once you know about this and you're aware of it, you can, you can just be a little bit more intentional, I guess, and in how you come across. Yeah. And was there anything in particular that I guess from a business standpoint, strategically that you learned about fundraising, you know, some people um, still see fundraising as a benchmark of success, right? But you and I know that it really isn't. Uh, it isn't. So, so talk to us a little bit from a commercial perspective here, you know, what was your strategy? And, and admittedly, before a, a big exit, many companies, um, had raised a lot more than you have before that point of right. exit, right? Um, right, but right. It was part of a decision. Talk to us about that strategy there. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, a consideration. So for example, we have a combination of venture, um, you, you know, investors, but we also have strategic investors. And even that decision, when do you take strategic money versus venture money? That's like a big decision. When we raised our round in 2011, when we turned that big, you know, $40 million check and instead focused on finding other investors. We took money in from WPP. They're a big advertising conglomerate and they ended up being our biggest client and partner. So they are both an equity investor, but they're also very strategic and they accelerated bringing our product to literally 90 countries around the world in less than six months. It was amazing wow. from a business standpoint, but what I guess I, underestimated when we took the money from them is that they had a lot of leverage over us, right? They were on our board. Um, you know, there was some exclusivity in place, so we couldn't work with their biggest competitors. We still can't work with their biggest competitors 10 years on. So, um, I mean, who you bring on as investors and their agenda and their definition of success, like our strategics don't care about valuation. They're not valuation sensitive at all but they do care about the business partnership. Our venture investors very much care about dilution and valuation and, and, and all of that. And so it's, it's just a very different lens on the business and knowing, you know, as a CEO or a founder that you will have different constituents with different agendas. That's really key because then you can, you can navigate it, um, I guess, and be more informed. Yeah, no, that, that's that's a great learning and, and definitely one that I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, discount, right? Because right. in the, you know, when, when you're sort of a little bit uh, less powerful in the bargaining, uh, right. tech, you think, oh, business partner, this is great. This guarantees revenues, right. but then right. uh, it's sort of hedging what you believe your, your growth to be, right? Exactly right. That's exactly right. And I, you know, just knowing that you're making these decisions. I don't know that I would have made a different decision, but just knowing going into it, that this, it has, it has implications for years to come. Like all of these little decisions that you make, right. They compound over, over the years. So, so that was an important yeah. takeaway. And then honestly, again, like, you know, and I, I wasn't very selective earlier in Affectiva's journey, but in 2018, I was quite selective around which investors we wanted to bring in. I made sure the two new funds we brought in had women partners and uh, or, or, or women, you know, senior in investment investors, basically, um, and also cared about diversity. Right. Like and you can tell, like, you know, these two particular funds asked about our commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. They wanted to know if, um, you know, what the numbers were. They wanted to see our commitment to ethics. And I was like, yes, we're aligned. We care about that, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you move along um, years later and you get an offer for an acquisition by SmartEye. Uh, and of course, this has come about not overnight, but with uh -huh. years of, of conversations and, and toils and things like that. Talk to us a little bit about that part of the chapter. You know, um, how did that come about? Were you already ready? Are you ever ready? <laughs> 
I think that's the question, actually, because over the years, we often got inbound interest uh, to sell and it never felt right to me. And then mm -hmm. in 2020, actually, at CES, just before the pandemic hit, we were at CES and, you know, exhibiting and, and I always made a point of getting to know my competitors. So I, I, I know all of, you know, our competitors, CEOs, and we're, we're very respectful of each other. And this particular company, SmartEye, we, we went to their booth, they came to our booth, and I think we quickly realized that we were encroaching in each other's spaces. Um, they've been around for 20 years. They're the global leader in driver monitoring. We are the new kids on the block, you know, using machine learning and data and, and um, quickly kind of expanding, you know, the, 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 I guess the application space of the technology. So, um, and we left, we left CES saying, okay, you know, let's stay in touch and let's think about partnering together. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and all of these conversations stopped. And then I think it's a combination of the pandemic. I think the pandemic just caused everybody to take a step back and, and rethink very, I guess, um, openly, you know, what could the universe look like? It, it, just, it just made me question all of my assumptions. And we reinstantiated our conversations with SmartEye and within, you know, I think, we started talking again in October and by January, you know, Martin said, wait a second, you know, are you open to an acquisition? And I was like, hmm, maybe I am. And I, I, I even actually surprised myself with the answer. Mm -hmm. um, we were in the midst of raising capital for the company. So that was going to be the alternative path to just like continue to grow the company. And I, I, I just felt like going it alone going it together was going to be more fun and hopefully, you know, guarantees faster and bigger success than going it alone. So, um, and then we had to do all of this over Zoom, right? We had to be, literally negotiate the whole deal. Y you know, I think if it was not a pandemic, we would just hop, hop on a plane and meet in person and hash it all out. But we were just having FaceTime conversations um, every mm. day. And so that was, that was uh, you know, how do you build true trust, you know, over Zoom? It's, it's not so easy. Yeah. And, and, you know, Rana, throughout this conversation, I noticed you use the, this word a lot. I felt, uh -huh. I felt this was the right uh -huh. time. And of course, you know, <laughs> someone who leans into emotion, right? This makes sense. But when you say I felt here, right? It, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. It's sort of your gut feeling, your intuition that this is the right time. How do you hone into over the years? I mean, you, you're the world expert on this, right? Oh. <laughs> emotion. How do you hone into that? You know, because I think it's, as leaders, we come across different opportunities all the time. Um, and sometimes it's an opportunity cost, right? You know, sure, there'll be, you know, tons of fish in the ocean. But what we don't talk about is every choice is an opportunity cost. So how right. do you think about that? And, and in your context of your exit to Smart Eye, what made you say, I felt that was the right thing to do huh. at that time? Um. So we're both young global leaders at the World Economic Forum, and uh, WEF has an amazing framework for responsible leadership. Mm. And it's five, you know, five pillars for what makes a responsible leader. Examples are data driven and, you know, caring about your stakeholders or at large, including the community and society you're in. But one of them is intuition. And I think that that's it's a superpower if you're able to tap into it. Um, and. I would have to say, like, I do a lot of journaling. I, I don't know about you, but I just try to use it as a way to almost listen to myself. So, um, and it's it's actually pretty amazing how some of my journal entries are like lead indicators. So, mm -hmm. so I'll give you an example. Sometimes I'll say, oh, you know, Dan doesn't look like he's in a good place. Like, I wonder what's going on. And then two weeks later, Dan quits. Right. And, 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 and part of me is like, if I just had listened to my gut more strongly and proactively, you know, checked in with Dan, I'm, I might have changed the, you know, I, I might have convinced him to stay. Right. So my, my gut is almost like an early kind of um, sensor for, for things around me. And, 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 I, and I think if you're able to take the time to listen to your intuition, I think it can be very powerful. So and especially in the pandemic. I mean, I've always been a big, you know, I journal a lot, but during the pandemic, I just made a lot of time to, 
you know, just think and, and reevaluate and reflect. Um, and so I felt, <laughs> it's interesting that you <laughs> noticed that. <laughs> I don't know if I was aware that I, uh, that I, I say it a lot, but um, it felt right. It felt right. And, and yeah. Um, yeah, it felt like the right time. Yeah. And, and talk to us for, you know, specific to uh, Smart Eye as, as the acquirer. I mean, I love how you uh, keep a close eye on your competitors and what they're doing. I mean, there were many in the market, right, that um, there were different use cases for what, what mm -hmm. the technology can be brought up to be. Uh, but you chose driver monitoring systems. You chose Smart Eye. What, what, what was it about them? What was it about this? I mean, it's a multi-billion industry, but talk to us about your vision here and, and why this made sense to you. Uh, on a number of levels, first of all, like let's start with the technology. Our technologies are very complementary. They do eye tracking, we do emotion recognition and interior sensing for the automotive industry. Our technologies plug in really well together. So, so that was like checkbox number one. Checkbox number two was, um, you know, the culture of the teams. And in my interactions with, especially at CES, when we had the opportunity to meet face to face. Um, I just felt like we shared a very similar culture. We're very R and D focused, um, no egos, you know, it's just about getting stuff done. And, and then the third aspect and, and caring about ethics too, like that was very important to me. And it was clear that they care about that as well. And then the kind of third piece of it, um, I just got along really well with Martin and I felt like it was actually bizarre because I meet a lot of CEOs and. I've never actually met a CEO who has the same exact vision like I do. And he uses like similar words. I was like, that is like, he sees an application of this technology across industries. We will eventually get there. Um, he uses the, I, I, we say humanizing technology before it dehumanizes us. And he said, you know, he uses the wording bridging the human machine gap. And I was like, wow, like we are so aligned in terms of vision. Um, so that, that was exciting as well. Um, now, you know, I, I always, I think it's important to always be honest. It's still hard, right? Integrating two teams, two cultures, um, two organizations. We do things one way, they do it a different way. And so this is all like taking time. Um, but I think at a high level, we're aligned um, on where we want to go and, and how we want to get there. There's a lot of mutual respect. So, you know, we'll, we will we'll make it happen. Take a, It'll take time, but we will get there. Yeah, and, and if, if you may, if you can, uh, talk to us a, a little bit about, you know, your new role now. You've taken on mm -hmm. uh, the, the title as deputy CEO. Uh, what does that mean? And, you know, what does that mean from a larger scale of your role in Smart Eye and also Effectiva and the initial vision? Has it evolved in, in a certain way? Uh, what's the vision sort of, you know, years down the line here? So, um, so deputy CEO is apparently a title that is, is more common in Europe, but it, it's essentially like a co-CEO. So my uh, role is to partner very closely with Martin, the CEO, and uh, you know, put in place a strategy for growth, execute that strategy, really focus on integrating the two companies um, and exploring what's next, right? Like we're focused on the automotive industry, but, but we also have our antennas up for what other market opportunities are there. And, and actually already we, um, just in the last couple of weeks, we acquired a company called iMotions. They integrate mm. multiple sensors. Um, so they have a software platform and we've known them. We've worked with them for many, both companies actually had worked with them for many years. So it was very um, synergistic to what we were doing. So just keeping an eye. Yeah. So, so how big is the team now? I mean, when, when the acquisition happened, remind me how many employees did you have? So smart. Eye were 150 employees, uh, headquartered mm -hmm. in, in Gothenburg, Sweden, and we were about 120. So it's like the company has doubled in size. Wow. Um, yeah, and then now we've brought on um, iMotions and they're about 50 people. Too. Yeah, and, and that's a big chapter. I mean, you know, it's the merging and I, I love, uh, you know, how raw you are. And, and I, I think, you know, people expect that, right? The post-merger integration, essentially, um, that usually is a whole consulting team um, to do sure. that for, for a certain reason. And, you know, where I want to go with this is what I've realized, um, 
you know, female founders talking, going back to, you know, topics we care about, female founders are now exiting quicker and at higher valuations. Mm -hmm. That's a good news story and also a bad news story, right? Because for some, um, it's under circumstances where they're burned out and Mm -hmm. they no longer want to do it. And that's the best or if not, you know, for some, the only option. Um, Some, you know, may not have the access and opportunities that you've had with multiple choice of investors wanting to write you that check and therefore the exit makes sense. So, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to be true to, you know, this this, uh, reality that we're faced with here, when you were thinking about your exit, you know, and now learning to power through and finding a new identity, um, what would you say to founders that are, you know, having these considerations of, do I continue on or do I go? And I am going to be quite vulnerable in in my answer to this. First of all, I felt a lot of guilt. I felt like I was um, giving in, you know, selling out on my baby because because Affectiva is like my baby. And and, and what I've come to realize that it's it's not selling out. It is graduating to a new chapter. Right. So so my daughter, you know, just turned 18 and she just started college. And so we moved her into her dorm and 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 I'm, I'm I haven't given up on her. It's just a new form of our relationship, right? And and I and you know we exited at exactly the same time when she was graduating high school. And it's 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 the same with Affectiva. We haven't sold out, but we are starting a new chapter for this journey. You know, Affectiva lives on, and now we're part of this bigger company, and we have more, you know, power to to go make things happen. So that's kind of point number one. Just kind of put it in perspective. Um, I think that's really key. Second is be kind to yourself, right? I, I, you know, I, I don't know that I'm totally burnt out because I love what I do, but a big part of me was thinking about the opportunity cost as well, right? Like I want to do a lot of other things. I want to serve on boards. I want to help young founders, um, who young as in early in their journey, um, help them, you know, find their path and, and support them, especially overlooked founders and ideas. And so I want to start a fund, for example, right? And I, I'm teaching at Harvard Business School. So I want to do all these other things. And there was no way I was going to get around to that as CEO. So um, this gave me an opportunity to, I guess, free up some of my my brain cycles and my time to explore some of these other venues and um you know, I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So um, it, it's definitely not easy. Um, I also found out that there is a a lot of documentation about how when founders, you know, exit their babies, their companies, there's an identity crisis because for the longest time I've been associated with Affectiva and, and now that's changing, right? And so I feel like, okay, who am I? <laughs> what do I stand yeah. for? Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a journey of introspection and, and just being patient, which I'm not good at. <laughs> and as I think many high performers are not, right? And it's interesting that you right. bring this up. I, the last conversation that I had was with, uh, you know, Susie Rogers, a British athlete who was a broad, you know, gold medalist and all that in, in swimming. And now it, she's on to the next stage as well. And she was mm-hmm. saying how it's hard. It's really hard, right? You know, no, everyone focuses on the performer, the athlete. And I think as CEOs, you are an athlete in a certain way. You're sort of on stage, you're on all the time. So everyone focuses on your development at that time. But what happens after, you know, how do you think about that? And how do you sort of transition and to make the most of, 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 uh, you know, this exit that, that you've built? And reinvent yourself, right? Like what are the core experiences and skills that I've acquired over the last, you know, 12, 15 years as an entrepreneur that I can bring with me to, to the next chapter. Right. And, and, and for me, for example, smart eye is a public company and that's different, right? So I'm learning a ton. And I was just at the board meeting in, in Sweden a few weeks ago and, and, you know, because it's a public company, it's different. So I, I'm savoring that and I'm enjoying that. I'm trying to learn lots. Um, but, but then again, like, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, you know, what have I learned as an entrepreneur that I could then use as almost like a differentiator if I start a fund, um, you know, bring that operator experience, bring that founder experience. 
So, um, yeah, I, I think like reinventing and almost like reskilling yourself is, is, is very important. Um, I also actually want to give a shout out to another YGL, uh, member, um, who is, uh, uh April, um, Ren, and oh, she yes. has a, yeah, she Flux. talks about flux and and having a career portfolio or a portfolio career where you you are a number of things you're not just one thing and that that totally applies to you sarah and i think <laughs> it applies to me as well so i'm thinking about that as well like what is what is my portfolio um mm, i absolutely love that well rana we've we've covered a lot of ground here from e ai to you know your founder journey and some of the hard lessons uh, it's now time for sort of the fire round, quick lightning round okay. of billion dollar questions. So eight quick questions and your quick responses to it. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Highest <laughs> high. <laughs> Highest high. Ooh, um, I have to like say that quick, right? What comes to mind? What's your first thing that comes to mind? I don't know. Gratitude. Does that apply? Well, it's uh, basically a moment, what? I guess. If something comes into oh, the like, highest high, when, the highest high, yeah, like the highest high moment. Okay, I think it's when my daughter got into college. That was a real, um, a real moment of of gratitude and celebration. Wow, lowest low. Ooh, um, that must be in 2013, where um, I was moving from Cairo to Boston on my own with two young kids, divorced, mm -hmm. and a lot of influx and challenges at, at, at Affectiva. That was definitely a low point. I felt alone and lonely. Mm. When you think of the word successful, who do you think of and why? The, oh, so, some person that's successful? Mm-hmm. Ooh. I am a huge fan. I, this sounds cliche, but it's so true. I am like a huge fan girl of Michelle Obama. I just love what she's done. And, um, you know, I hope one day I'll have, you know, just, just broad impact. It's, it's just amazing. Yeah. So. yeah. No questions on that choice there. Common <laughs> misconceptions about Rana. Oh, people see that I'm nice and they think I'm weak. And ah. I'm like, no, 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 no. I can be nice, but, but, but that, you know, I'm also, you know, kick ass. And firm. Yeah. Worst advice that you've been given. Oh. Um, I think just ad advice that's along the lines of, uh, Ooh, that's like too risky. Nobody's done this before. You know, you're going to fail miserably. Like, why do that? Like, why don't you just like stick to your, you know, stick to the path, you know, I've heard that so many times when starting the company, when getting my PhD and now, you know, now that I'm considering a fund, you know, I keep getting, well, but, but you don't know anything about investing. Like why, why don't you just like continue the path you're on? And so mm. I have learned to ignore this advice. <laughs> That's good. Uh, your favorite productivity hack or tool? Ooh. Um, I've gotten into the habit of, um, spending 10 minutes in the morning doing affirmations, but also being like listing my intentions for the day. And that's mm. really been helpful to get me to focus on the things that matter and not just, you know, little things that, that don't, that don't add up. Yeah. Absolutely love that. Uh, I know you mentioned Rosalind Pickard for your favorite book. Um, but let's choose another one, another favorite book and why. I love The Obstacle is the Way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's an amazing, very easy read. And it just talks about how we all run into obstacles, but, you know, successful people are those who find a way through. And it could be around it, above it, below it, but, but like you, 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 found, you find a way through the obstacle. And I, I love that. Yeah. And now uh, this is a shout out for your book. And this is almost like choosing your favorite children. But um, if you could think about a single part of the book that's your favorite, which part would that be? Oh, I, I know the answer to that. There's a chapter in the book where I talk about um, becoming a U.S. citizen and how mm -hmm. I had to study for the test. And, you know, th that same year we bought a house uh, in, in, in the Boston area and just re like really made 
the U.S. our home, and and yeah, I, I talk a lot about what what that meant uh, for me, kind of professionally, but also personally, and I, I love that chapter. Okay, we will be highlighting that. And finally, <laughs> three qualities. I mean, you talk about your daughter that's off to university, and you know she's done some amazing things already.、Uh, kudos to you, mom. But for your kids, right?、Uh, what are the three qualities that you want them to continue to espouse and hold as core values for their lives? You know, it's funny you ask that because we spend a lot of time as a family deciding on these core values, and incidentally, we spend a lot of time as a company deciding on these values, and they overlap hugely. So the、mm. top three would be be a lifelong learner, always have intellectual curiosity about the world and about people and cultures. Um, so that's number one. Number two is be empathetic. You know, prioritize human connection. Be compassionate. Be kind. I always tell my kids' teachers, like, I don't care if they ace the math test. I mean, I kind of care, but I, I care more that they're kind and compassionate with their peers at school and just respectful of everybody. So that's number two. And then number three is work hard. And on that note, you know, you're working so hard.、Uh, I know on your next chapter, and I'm so excited for. Your portfolio career and and how that turns out, but really, Irana, thank you so much for your time. I think this has been really insightful, and really grateful to you for for sharing your insights that will、uh, inspire. I know it has inspired me and also the next generation of founders and funders that tune into this. Thank you, Irana. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chen Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chen Spellings, and you've been listening to Billion Dollar Moves.